it's important for neurodiverse individuals such as myself, such as others, because by no means am I the only one. It's significant to have an autistic voice present in these kind of therapies to really have people understand that individualism and differentiation as well as self-advocacy needs to be the main cornerstone of this entire science. Welcome to Adulting on the Spectrum. In this podcast, we want to highlight the real voices of autistic adults, not just inspirational stories, but people like us talking about their day-to-day -day life. Basically, we want to give a voice to a variety of autistic people. I'm Eileen Lam, an autistic photographer from France, and I co-host this podcast with Andrew Camero. Hey, Andrew. Hey, Eileen. I am Andrew Camero, an autistic software engineer. I am not from France, and I am the better-looking co-host of this podcast. Today, our guest is Armado. Um, so <laughs> we like this. If, have you listened to our podcast before? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's fun. It's a good time for you guys. Awesome. So, so then you know that we uh, like to ask each guest how they prefer to identify, whether that's a person with autism on the spectrum, etc. Uh, do you have a preference? If so, what is it? And if you could give us a short bio because we neglected to get that from you. That's no problem at all. Um, yeah, so I, I, I guess I go back and forth, honestly, but um, typically autistic individual is just fine uh, with me. So I have been a board certified behavior analyst now for about four years. Uh, previously, before that, I was a special education teacher uh, within Houston, Texas. And currently, I am the owner of the only autistic-owned ABA company in Houston, uh, where we work with really children and adults anywhere between 18 months onward. So we've had 15-year-olds, uh, 20-year-olds. Uh, we had a recommendation once for a 39-year-old. Um, I've also been a podcast host myself. So this is uh, rather familiar to me. Um, I had a podcast uh, in 2020 uh, called A Different Path, where I would interview individuals with autism as well to really try and promote um, this idea that self-advocacy is everywhere. And much like you guys, that regardless of the diagnosis, there are many things that be accomplished by individuals with autism. Um, and since then, I've, I've taken it upon myself. I created this company along with my sister, uh, where we provide support and really try to push the idea that self-advocacy can be achieved by many individuals with autism, as well as uh, general success for each person that we work with. Can you tell us about your own diagnosis journey? When were you diagnosed with autism? Yeah, absolutely. So I was diagnosed at three. So some of this history um, was given by my mother and my sister, who's uh, 11 years older than me. Uh, but my um, I was diagnosed at three where my mother was told by her doctor that I might as well learn sign language because I was never going to be able to speak. Uh, and in Texas in the 90s, early 2000s, where I was born, uh, that was pretty much the end of that conversation for her and the doctor. They The doctor had many other patients to see and basically sent her on her way. And so my mother stood up to this doctor and said, no, that that's not going to be the case. Uh, so we didn't have a lot of money. We couldn't afford applied behavior analysis uh, therapy back then. It wasn't medically uh, given by insurances, but we did have access to the free public library. Uh, so she was able to go to the library, find out more information about autism, more information about how to support my language development. And through her support, along with my sister, my father, generally my family, um, I was able to get to a point where I am today. And I, I go into this later, always usually in my presentations, uh, but I always 100% believe that if it was not for the support and the care of my family, that I would not be anywhere where I am today. It's because they believe that I could accomplish these kind of things that I was able to uh, do what I can currently today. I mean, you were pretty well supported. And then um, what made you decide to get into the business of torture? No, I mean, what made <laughs> you um, uh, decide to go into, you know, the, the field of ABA? Why, why did you choose this as a career for all the other careers you could add? You know what? I, I love the fact that you had that little side, side comment there, right? Because that's what I typically get in my career path. 
is I get two sides of things. I get one side that says, you're such an inspiration, great job, I can't believe you reached this level. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side, I get comments such as that earlier, where it's, um, how could you be ever, ever be a part of something so terrible, right? And so partially, to, to go back a little bit, right, I was a special education teacher just trying to work with other individuals with autism because I didn't want other families to have to go through what my mother did and really help others understand that you can accomplish many different goals for yourself or independence uh, through a lot of support. But as I was with these families, I realized that there had to be more that I could do and I found applied behavior analysis. Um, and I give this analogy typically in these presentations and I'm always welcome to these kind of conversations where it's, um, if you had a bad experience with a medical doctor, that would typically not turn a person off from Western medicine, but instead you would go about it and try and find a doctor that fit your beliefs, your ideologies, your mentality. Uh, and so I say the same thing for applied behavior analysis, is that admittedly, that ABA does have quite a bit of a dark history, um, but most often it is because of the bad practitioner that provided poor support and poor um, treatment to those individuals, um, as well as the fact that behavioral science, which applied behavior analysis is based off of, is truly around everybody, um, no matter how you take a look at it, right? It's behavioral science is simply the study of actions that people do and the reasons behind them. Um, and so I get, in every meeting like this as well, I also mentioned that um, everyone's voice should be honored and respected. And if an individual had a terrible time in ABA, that's not my place to say whether or not they did or not, right? But it is my place in my current position to try to make a difference and, and show that ABA can have a positive approach, much like many of the kids that I've served. Um, I give an example of one who ate nothing but veggie chips and a multivitamin drink, and he was seven years old. And through our own uh, workings, right? Working with the family, working with this child, focusing on self-advocacy again, um, he was able to get to a point where he had a, a diet that could sustain him, uh, whether that was pizza, pancakes, sandwiches, things of that nature, right? And again, it's, I, I, I could talk all day. I love this. Honestly, I love that we started off with this uh, because of the fact that in addition to this, it's this idea that nothing good can come of this, right? right? Uh, of applied behavior analysis, but it's so significant to understand that in order to change this dark history that ABA has, or in order to change the wrongs that it has done in the past, it's important for neurodiverse individuals such as myself, such as others, because by no means am I the only one, it's significant to have an autistic voice present in these kind of therapies to really have people understand that individualism and differentiation as well as self-advocacy needs to be the main cornerstone of this entire science. So, um, a, a bit long-winded, but I hope that helps. I, I completely agree with you on a lot of levels. And, um, you know, two, two things that come to mind is, so one, there, there's a great uh, advocate I know who's, uh, I think, again, ABA therapist, um, not autistic, but she, I know she listens to every podcast episode, so I know she'll listen to this one. Um, and, you know, I, I said to her, like, you know, with all the, she cares so much, too. Like, if she was looking to get into ABA today and Googled ABA on the internet, she would not have gone into ABA. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm like, that's a problem that should be solved because that means the best people, the, the, the people who mean the best, who want to get in and everything for the right reasons, you know, are, are potentially being like turned away and you know sh she agreed right so it's like okay we should change that discussion so you know you the younger you right didn't call you old um you know <laughs> you know would you know would still help people and I mean the other one too is um when it comes to nonprofits right you know like if when it will talk about that in a little bit, but that's, I mean, that's part of like why doing this podcast or why have the conversation with people, right? Because if, yeah. you know, if you're not involved at all, people are going to make decisions without you and, you know, just canceling. And I mean, ABA isn't going to go away tomorrow, right? Um, so what are you doing? Let's, let's make something better, right? So, I mean, and that, and that's exactly it, right? Like if, for my company, I, my company's name, I don't know if I mentioned it, it's Autism International Consulting. And for my company, 
we believe that if anyone is going to take the brunt of the comments, the concerns, the conflict, let it be me, right? And I said earlier, I am the only autistic-owned ABA company in Houston. And for those that may know or may not know, Houston is a rather large city. And the fact that I am the only one in that city that is autistic and owns an ABA company is, I get, I know, again, the, a response of, wow, that's so cool. But is it, though? Because it should be so many other autistic individuals uh, that are owning these ABA companies and really trying to shape what ABA should be or what ABA can be. Um, and, and so what I try to do is currently become a model for other people to look at and to say, if he can do it, I can do it too. And I would love the opportunity to try and help out other autistic individuals to do more of this kind of work. Uh, and again, not because it's 100% right all of the time, right? It's not, it's a science. And I also say that it, a science remains a science so long as it grows. And as soon as you start saying you've learned all you can and it plateaus and it's no longer a science. But being able to listen to these voices that say, hey, ABA was wrong for me because of X, Y, Z, that gives us an opportunity then to work on ourselves and by ourselves, I mean, both as the practitioner as well as the science to do better by people. And, and you said it best, Andrew, as well, where it's not going away, right? It, it's been here since the fifties, the sixties. So why not make it better instead of allowing it to dwindle and get worse and worse? Why not do what we can to try and uh, better promote a, a better form of ABA rather than focusing on any kind of money that can be made or any kind of uh, quantitative um, data or, or, or risks toward it and, and more so focus on how can we make a child's life or an adult's life different and better um, where they can become independent and rely on themselves instead of other people. Yeah, you guys are. I love this conversation. I mean, I'm a big, big, big fan of, of ABA therapy because it's helped my son so much. He's been in ABA for eight years now. Um, but I love what you said about the comparison to uh, Western medicine. And I always use that example of uh, the dentist for me because I had a horrible experience with a dentist in France. Like he was like sh shaming me for the issues I was having. Some of them were my fault. Some of them were not my fault. But anyway, I didn't go to the dentist for five years after that experience because of how like traumatizing that was. That guy was, I mean, I can't even begin to explain to you how bad that dentist was. But I never said all the field of dentistry is abusive, right? I knew it was like that one guy. And so then I found a dentist who was like caring and was able to like, you know, make my anxiety go down and reassure me. And that's when I was able to finally go back to the dentist. So I think it's very important for people to realize what you said, that it's not the field of ABA that's abusive. It's like maybe certain people are abusive and I would go, as far as to say that most people are not going to be abusive on, on purpose, they can be like taught, you know, like for yeah. instance, maybe some therapists think that for forcing eye contact is good. Like I, I would don't like that, but maybe you can tell that therapist, Hey, I, I don't want my child to, to be forced to make eye contact. Right. So I think there are a lot of nuances here that people are not necessarily like understanding. Um, so what would you say? to a person who says that you're abusing kids for a living, that ABA is abusive, what would your answer be? Yeah, no, it's a really good question, right? And, and, and before I get back into that, it is very much your point where you're saying people are not intentionally trying to abuse these children and rather it is misinformation, misguidedness, uh, misunderstanding of what can possibly occur with these children to, to be successful, right? And it's why we had individuals in the 90s, 2000s, where this, this growth and, and traumatization did occur, uh, right, in, in, in my viewpoint, where it's this idea that, oh, a child has to make eye contact, or a child can't stand, or the hand flopping, for anyone that may not know, the, or it can't, and can't repeat their words and sounds. This is absolutely wrong. And you fast forward 10, 15, 20 years later, and we have individuals who say, no, that was incorrect. This was poor ABA. This was poor information that was being traveled. And let's resolve this. It's very similar to the idea that, and this is another hot topic, that vaccines cause autism. That was a very misguided and misconstrued medical journal that was eventually redacted, that that person lost their license, bless you. And being able to promote this idea that 
there can be good from this, right? It's going to come with challenges. You're going to have a lot of naysayers. You're going to have a lot of individuals that say that, well, that's that's not possible that they can do this because it, it didn't happen for me, right? And that is, again, you have to honor, you have to respect those opinions. And you can't say, well, that did it. You're wrong. That's not true, right? It happened for them and you can't tell someone how they feel. But what you can do is provide um, observation and you can provide transparency. And I think that is how we change this field is, and my sister says this, is that you get in trouble most of the time when you try and hide something. You don't get in trouble as much when you admit that you were wrong and that you want to fix something, right? And the more individuals that say, no, 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 you can't see our therapy because that's going to mess up everything we worked on. This is wrong. That's an awful way, again, in my opinion, to put it. And instead, having that transparency to say, if you have concerns, please observe. If you have concerns, you're welcome. So in my area, and this is, you know, this invitation to you guys, but I think you guys are probably a bit too far from my, from my company. You're welcome to observe. And you're welcome to, to take um, a gander at it and see what, what we do, right? And again, for those people that say, you know, it, it is, you know, you're abusing that child. All I can really say to, to change their mind is come and see for yourself. I'm not in the business to argue. I'm in the business to discuss and, and debate and, and have a well-rounded conversation where we can have open ears, right? But for those that are stonewalled, nothing can change their mind. It's, re it's rather difficult, right? And there's a big conversation that happens currently where it's, you have to look at this rise in social media and the rise in negativity toward ABA and see that correlation that it's a lot of the times it has been those who are loudest on social media do get their voice uh, put across. And you have a lot of people then on social media say, wow, I had no idea that person's right because they have the million followers or the 10 million followers. And so they're more inclined to listen. But what is necessary to really make this realistic change for people is to be willing to talk about these things uh, as well as to be willing to show what you have to present. Right. And this is why, you know, again, Andrew, I know you jokingly said it, but I get that comment more often than you would think. Or maybe you do think that. I don't know. Um, but it's it's up to me to not shy away from it. And as an autistic individual, but also as a professional in the field to say, let's talk about it. Let's let's have a conversation that can really open up some doors where maybe we can meet in the middle and see how we can better support uh, everyone that we serve. Well said. And totally on the social media aspect. I mean, I have a pretty big social media following, but it really you drives do? me crazy. Yeah, I just reached uh, 200,000 followers on Instagram. Just want to say Congratulations. It. Congratulations. That's awesome. As of last night. And you know what I did? I made a post in my stories and I was like, oh, before I make an official announcement, let me tell you that I'm pro vaccines, pro ABA, that I eat pasta with ketchup you know i just wanted people to want to be <laughs> and you do crossfit and you're a libertarian yeah pineapple <laughs> on pizza just all the hot topics there you go i just wanted them to unfollow before i made the announcement because it's somewhere <laughs> and, you know how many unfollows and, did you get not that many actually i guess people Good. really eat uh, pasta with ketchup um so <laughs> no but, but for real it's so annoying because one thing I'm very careful about doing or not doing is to make sure that I'm I'm not speaking on behalf of the entire community, right? And I feel like a lot of people on social media with big platforms and the one who have honestly like very extreme opinions, you know, like I feel like even though we're pro-ABA, we can listen to the other side and understand some of their perspectives, right? They make it sound like, well, the autistic community is against ABA, you know, they very big gener generalization and that's something that really bugs me because that's that's not fair you know it should be clear that someone's opinion is just their opinion and that they're not speaking on behalf of the autistic community because nobody can speak on behalf of the autistic community because we're all different you know so i think that was a very good point you made there and i don't know where i was going but i needed to say that but thank you i appreciate that and that's why i through many of these answers I've given you so far, I try to make sure I say this is my opinion only. This is not in representation of others that may be listening. Um, but it's it's just significant to to point out that pe people, it's okay to have different opinions as well. It's okay to have these open conversations. But I think so often these days, we're very quick to shut people down if we don't think the same way. 
But again, that's not how we grow. We have to listen to each other to, to really make a difference. So I, I see that you're involved with the Doug Flutie Foundation. Yeah. Um, what made you want to get involved and how did you get involved? Yeah, um, it, it, it's pretty cool. It's just, it's rather recent too. So I'm actually like, I'm still very excited about it that they wanted me to be a part of that. Um, I, I got involved because of the amazing work that they are doing for, again, autism awareness, autism acceptance. And it's such a significant and incredible uh, organization. And for them to even consider me to be a part of something like that, that was a real honor for me. I got involved after learning more about them from um, some friends of mine um, that are also Flutie Fellows as well. And, and because of their excitement for the program, as well as their motivation, I really wanted to be a part of this. And so since, this is, again, rather recent. But since being a part of them, my, my goal really is just to try and uh, support as much information as they can to show people that there are exceptionally good people out there trying to do amazing things for autistic individuals, uh, much like you, you and Eileen here are trying to bring awareness. It's the same thing for the Doug Flutie Foundation is that um, through their efforts, there has been a significant change, again, in my opinion, of how autism is viewed. And again, you look back 20 years ago, and there was a greater idea of victimization, I call it, for autistic individuals in the sense that they can't do anything for themselves, that they can't feed themselves, or they can't do other aspects that general individuals can do. But now there's a increasing change toward, no, they are able to do anything that they put their mind to. That they, that yes, the autism diagnosis can possibly become an obstacle for some, but through support from their families, their guardians, their professionals, they're able to accomplish things that maybe six months, a year ago, their parents never thought would be possible. Um, so organizations like Doug Flutie, to answer your question, are, are phenomenal. And it's, I'm, I'm quite honored to be a part of their organization. Can you tell us what struggles you have with being a business owner uh, and, you know, being employees? What are some of the struggles uh, that you've encountered? <laughs> Um, it's, it's not getting any sleep. <laughs> it's, it's being a small business owner and, and hoping that I'm making the right decisions each and every day. Um, and I, I, I have, obviously I have the diagnosis of autism, also have anxiety and, and I'm on medication for it and it helps quite a bit, but it's the idea that I want to do what's best, obviously for the patients that we're serving and, and the children that we're serving, but also for our therapists and our staff to make sure that they are taken care of in, in any way that we possibly can, right? To the extent of what a business is able to do. So my biggest concerns currently is, again, am I making the right choice? And I feel like both of you guys are able to take that into consideration as well, where it's, I'm just doing what I think is right, and I hope it is, but I won't know until, you know, maybe a day, a week, a month later, a year later. Um, and it's the idea that I have to keep making these kind of decisions. and. For me, it's it's making sure that my my employees are happy, that they have an excellent work life balance, um, and really, am I listening to their goals for their life? And and a lot of my employees will will understand that when I say it. Where I want each person that we hire or that we work with to tell me what their ambitions are, and. I will do my very best to try and support them in any way possible. And I always jokingly tell them, I'm a little biased, but I hope you know your ambition is to be a BCBA. Uh, but it's also, if you want speech therapy, if you want occupational therapy, any real sector of any kind of area, department that you want to be in, how can I support you through that? And looking at my employees, not as employees, but rather as partners in the sense of, they are literally what makes my entire company um, is very, significant to me and in addition i could not do this without having my sister to support me who she handles the administrative side of things so i again jokingly tell her that she does all the boring paperwork and i get to play with the lego so it's a win-win uh, but being able to have someone such as that in my life is a, a real honor it's a joy and it, I, I truly could not do this without her as well as the rest of the, the people i work with that's awesome. Yeah, it's funny, too, because, you know, when, you know, somebody has strengths or weaknesses, you know, I remember there was 
someone I was talking to and, you know, their son was on track to be, you know, a mathematical professor, but, you know, doesn't like clean his room or like, you know, um, I'm like, well, I mean, mathematical professors make enough to hire somebody to clean their room for, you know, like, yep. I don't know. <laughs> So I, I mean, you know what, but it's okay. Why is it okay? And so understood for a business owner to have help with the stuff they don't like to do like paperwork, right. And have employees, but you know, um, so I always think the more people can focus on doing what they like to do and what they're good at the better. So, yeah. And, and, and you get people that enjoy their time at work. And I mean, in, in reality is right. That a lot of full time is 40 hours. That is a long time to be away from your family. That is a long time to be away from your home, for your, from your dog, from your cat, your bird, whatever it is. And, and it's significant to me as a practitioner myself, as well as somebody that's just trying to do some good for these kids um, to make work at least a little enjoyable and not seem like work, right? And just have that ability to enjoy it a bit more. And if I can have them enjoy it a bit more by just listening to them, by saying, I hear you and I understand what your goals are. Let me help you and let me look and see what I can do. Like that's a really good day in, in my opinion. Mentorship also seems a big part of your work. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, it's the idea too, right? That individuals that are in this field, yeah, it's, it's great that they're in it. They're making a change. I try to do a change. I'm doing things like this podcast to try and better support that idea. But it's significant to prepare the next generation of behavior analysts. It's significant to prepare the next generation of speech therapists, occupational therapists, and, and also try and have this idea that we can grow and learn from one another. It's by no means, do I sit here or do I go to work and say, oh, I know everything in the world. You have to listen to my opinion. It is 100% needs to be a continual conversation from one another. It's if I am an owner of a company currently, right? At once upon a time, I was a guy just interviewing at a job at another company, trying to make my way. And at some point in time, maybe the person that was interviewing me, maybe they want to come and work for my company, right? It's about learning from one another. It's about learning that we are only going to be as good as we can be if we remain open-minded. And we talked briefly about that earlier in this, in this conversation. And it's, just really trying to make sure that we can do as much as possible to promote that kind of growth that can then trickle down to the patients that we're serving uh, and, and just keep the, the good times going. What would be your best piece of advice to um, families of young people on the autism spectrum? Like, uh, if their child has just been diagnosed, what's the best advice you can give them? Sure. It's, there's a lot that goes into that, right? And you're, you're, you're bringing up a scenario that for a lot of parents, guardians is heartbreaking. It is um, terrifying. It is uh, concerning. And just like my mother who expressed all of this to me, that all of these things, it just kind of seemed like the lights went out. That is just, there was no kind of future for me. She was able to pick herself up and say, okay, that's enough now. We need to figure out a plan, right? And so for these parents that are getting this diagnosis, I, I'd, I'd like to tell them to continue to support your child, that despite any kind of diagnosis that a doctor throws at you, your child, you're going to know your child best. You're going to know what they need. And truly the more that you believe that your child can accomplish certain things the more likely they will be able to and again i say that over and over where it's i wasn't speaking and my mother said no we're going to work through this together you and me you know armando and and me mom and because of my mother my sister my father i i'm at a point where i i like to think i'm successful <laughs> uh, but again if it wasn't for them I don't think I, I could call myself that and it's truly the parents the guardians the professionals that 100% believe in their heart that, that that this child this certain child can do something with their life um, that's where we see the most success good to hear and so you work for several 
universities as well, right? Um, talk a little bit about college, um, any advice, those on the spectrum college journey, and um, a little bit about what you do with maybe some universities as well. Yeah, no, that's that's all really good. I appreciate you mentioning all of that. It's for me, and again, I'm very transparent in these kind of conversations where I was ashamed of my diagnosis for quite some time, up until college. And again, it, it had more to do probably with the time period that it wasn't a big topic uh, to speak on that people spoke about their their mental diagnoses and all that. Um, but once I got out of college, I realized how significant it could have been to be more accepting of it. Uh, and so for those in college or seeking college, right? Number one, if you believe it, go for it, right? The worst that could happen is that it just wasn't for you. And that's okay too, right? It's about finding your calling and look for structure, look to self-advocate and make sure that you self-advocate because it can be nerve wracking to try and do that for yourself. It's a lot easier said than done, but if you do start to self-advocate for yourself. You can see such significant changes in support systems that I don't know that a lot of people know are out there. Even some parents that I speak to at a younger age and I tell them about the resources that are out there, they're just so shocked by everything that could possibly occur for their child. Um, so I would really recommend that regarding uh, the college journey. Regarding my time now, working with universities, it's a lot much like this, where I do presentations, I do uh, self-advocacy presentations. I do panels where I get the conversations of, you know, how could you be both autistic as well as be a BCBA? Um, or it's, you know, again, the, the opposite. Oh, you're such an inspiration. Tell me more about living with your autism. And what was that like? Right. And usually there's here and there, the stereotypical, but you don't look autistic kind of comment. And I always suggest, and I, excuse me, not suggest, I always uh, mention that what you see is not um a, a brand new diagnosed you know autistic child it is 30 years of work where i went through aggression self-injury tantrums and i had to overcome these things and for you to not judge a book by its cover as an individual right and to look as this at this autistic individual and see what they want you to see or what i want you to see and know that there may be a completely different story behind that quote unquote mask if you bring up masking and other kind of podcasts uh, and and understand that there needs to be more work done for less so, I believe, about awareness and more so about acceptance at this point in time. Uh, and and through these universities that you mentioned, that's that's what I do is is to try and promote the idea that we need to be more accepting of each other's um, private life, if you will, and and know that each person is really just trying to do the best they can. In 50 years from now, what would you like the world of autism advocacy to look like? I feel like you have almost answered that question in your previous answer, but go for it. Well, if I was 50, that would be like 80. So gosh, that's a while. <laughs> um, it, what I want to see for self-advocacy, right, is the idea that, yes, there is, you know, some accommodations that come with the diagnosis of autism, but for somebody to not be turned away just because they have autism. Um, and obviously there's there's laws and things that, that prevent that, right? But there's always much this connotation that it is a lot more work to hire someone with autism than not. And that's prevented me from getting some jobs that I had applied for in the past. So what I would really like to see is this idea that somebody says that they have this diagnosis and a company or friends or support system just say, okay, thanks for telling me. How can I support that? How can I support you? And it just being a a way of working together in that sense, if that makes sense, I hope it does. Uh, and really trying to promote the idea that there shouldn't be a means of competition with one another. There's always this rat race of, well, I'm better than this person or I'm better than this person, but instead moving toward this person is struggling with X, Y, Z, how can I support them and how can I help them? Um, and, and having that kind of give and take where if you help one person with something they're struggling with, odds are you have something you're struggling with and that person has a strength in there that they'll help you in turn as well. Um, Self-advocacy for me is, is really this idea that I can say that there is something that I need help in 
and I am aware of it, but I want to learn from it. Uh, and I want to grow from this and become better. And I think we're getting there uh, each you know, year, I'll say year just for the sake of timing, each year, because we got 50 years each year, but it's also, there's a lot more work that needs to be done, but it's because of podcasts like this, it's because of companies, uh, you mentioned nonprofits, that are bringing more awareness toward and acceptance of autism and the abilities that those with autism can do, um, that we're seeing realistic change um, each and every year. Yeah, and I, I mean, I'd even argue, you know, ideally just one step further, right, where a company is just inclusive, so it doesn't, to the point where it doesn't matter what somebody says, right, like yes. if an employee needs something that'll make them happier so they can do a job better, like, why wouldn't you want them to have it, right, you know, yeah. we're, I think we're a long ways from that, but it, it definitely is the the dream, so, um, do you, and do you have any, yeah, again, um, just, recommendations on how employers can change their recruitment or interview process to be more inclusive and um how many and also just separate question how many employees do you have and do you know what percent are neurodivergent um so th those are both good questions so i'll start off with like the ideas of what a business can do and i think for the businesses right it is the idea of listening and for it to be more of a um not pop culture, but uh, current events, that's the word. For a current event sector, you're seeing that more and more in the news that people are starting to listen to their workers or their employees. And you see several different strikes that are currently going on. The writer strike, the actor strike. And just recently, it, it is supposedly going to be done soon, this strike, because a deal has been made that was acceptable, right? And it's this idea that employers need to listen to their employees and that it needs to be uh, quick in response, right? It's not the idea of, well, let's do a yearly survey and see how people are doing, right? It's having, you know, these kind of anonymous surveys that people are willing to input whenever they will like, and that and to not be scared of that kind of thing. Having quarterly updates or quarterly meetings of all different departments, all different individuals that can really support the idea of change, right? So for your business question i believe that the best thing that an employer can do is listen uh we've been listening to our employees since our inception and we have made a lot of mistakes admittingly again but i mean like what company hasn't but it's it's not the mistakes that are the issue it's when you make the mistakes and you refuse to change and blame others for the mistake so we look at our mistakes and we say we can be better we can do better and doing our very best to to complete that uh that action uh regarding your other portion of of the question where it's how many employees i have right it's it's we're we're small um we're currently at 16 but if you you know looked at us even a month ago we weren't at that number we're continually growing and it's it's because of wonderful people that believe in our mission that believe in our values that believe that we are making a change that we when we say that we are providing a better form of ABA, a self-advocacy um, inspired ABA or transparent ABA is we mean it. And, and we want to continue to grow that um, slowly, conservatively to a point so we can maintain the quality that we are currently providing. I'm going to ask you a few more questions. Sure. So first, where can people find you on social media, if anywhere, anything you want to promote, like self-promotion? That was your okay. time. Yeah, absolutely. So if anybody has, you know, questions, concern, uh, questions or um, ideas or really want to learn more about our company, um, they can find us at, at Autism INTL on Facebook, Instagram, um, as well as at AutismINTL.com. Um, and that's also where they can find some of our other resources, any kind of provisions that we have. Unfortunately, we're currently only serving the Houston area, uh, but we do consultation uh, really throughout the world at this point. We work with other countries, uh, the United Kingdom. Um, we've done Guam, Pakistan, South Africa. And, and really, again, the mission here of why we're called Autism International Consulting is because we want to help. There are many people that don't have resources like we do in, in Texas and other areas. 
And so we want to help support as many people as we can. Um, and again, I, I'm thankful for the time here. I'm thankful for the Doug Flutie Foundation. I'm thankful for um, a number of organizations that I'm a part of and that I, I try to make some kind of change that can really help uh, promote others. So again, you know, please feel free to say hi to me at Autism INTL. Thank you. To finish this, I'm going to ask you some quick fire questions. Are you ready? Okay, ready. Favorite animal? Ooh, uh, giraffe. What do you think of the word moist? Please don't say it again. <laughs> Agreed. And I just, <laughs> Andrew, Andrew always sneaks in a quick fire question that he knows I'm going to cringe at. And he did it very well. Um, favorite movie uh interstellar favorite pizza topping oh tons of pepperoni i i get i'm the double pepperoni kind of person and uh favorite musical instrument oh that's cool um i'm gonna say trombone because i used to play trombone as a child uh wasn't expected that but that's yeah. awesome yeah thanks what instrument were you expecting, Eileen? Something like guitar or piano. I feel like if the person is not a musician, they're going to say something more mainstream, you know? But he yeah. was a musician, and we didn't know, see? Yeah, yeah. no one really knows that. I played in elementary and middle school. My high school didn't have uh, a band elective, but I, yeah, I miss it. And you're not, you're the second person this week to ask me that, so that's funny. That is really random. Yeah, yeah it is. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I really enjoyed uh, chatting with you and making another great argument in favor of ABA therapy. <laughs> it is an absolute honor to be with each of you. Thank you so much for your time and thank you everyone for listening. Thank you. Thank you.